from reading your Bible? What is the outcome that you expect to be produced when you take that time in the morning or the evening or whatever time it is, however often it is when you pray to God? What did you come to expect? Because one of the things that I want to look at here for the next couple of months in talking about developing a deeper faith is something that, frankly, we don't talk a lot about. Church and and, and I listen to different sermons and lessons and commentaries, and, and a lot of them are very, you know, good. They're very analytical and anecdotal, and they'll teach you things, and, and they're very good for application. But one of the things that, frankly, we have, I think, missed, that we have got to come to expect if we're ever going to grow in our faith, is understanding that there's an experience that we should get from our relationship with God that isn't normal. If all I'm going to do when I pray and talk to God is just have a conversation, then I can just have a conversation with one of you all. And yes, I'm going to talk to God. We're going to, and it's not like there's some amazing, you know, magical thing that always happens every time I pray. But more importantly, there's a word. And, and this is what I gave the uh, sermon, a title today that reflects this. It's called Supernatural. Do we expect the supernatural from our faith with God? Do we actually expect that something different, something that I can't get from any other man or woman, something that I can't get from my job, something that I can't get from just having day-to-day -day activity. Do I expect the supernatural when it comes to my faith? Because let's face it, when we come together here and we gather and we, we worship God, what is the outcome that we expect? What are we looking for when we come together every Sunday? You know, I thought about this. I love this. It says, faith has its reason. In order for us to really experience the faith that God wants us to experience in order for us to be able to really understand and grow in our faith, very often what we have to do is understand that it isn't always going to make sense. Not only is it always going to make sense, but very often it's not going to be able to be explained. See, we want answers for everything, right? We want to just, if something happens, we want to pull out our phone or something, we want to Google it. You know, we see a butterfly or a bird or we see some weird thing happen in the sky. We want to be able to Google it, take a picture and put it out there and post it. What does this mean? Well, can somebody explain this? But do we really come together? Do we worship God? Do we seek God in a way that says, I know that I'm going to have an encounter with God that's not necessarily going to be able to be explained? Because that in and of itself has a lot to do with our faith or lack of. You know, why do we go to church? Do we go to church to feel better? Do we go to church to ease our conscience? Do we go to church because we want to get something out of it? Maybe we need some help, you know, and, and we know that the church is a safe place for that. Maybe, you know, I'll show up to church because I know if I'm in a bind, I know that there are people there who are willing to love me unconditionally, support me. And all of that is true. But is that the reason why we should be here right now? What is the expectation? What are we looking for when we show up? I like this one. You are welcome here. It's got the nice little church, you know, everything fits. And, and, and that's kind of what we want to believe. That, you know, but what happens if you're not welcome? What happens if you don't get that feeling of, man, you know what? This is where I belong. This is where I fit. What happens if it's not all hugs and kisses? Maybe there's something going on. But being welcome, feeling the nice little fuzzy warm feeling, is that the reason that we come to church? Is that the reason why we seek the face of God and we worship him so that we can feel like we belong? What is the reason? Is it so that we can be welcome? You know, I like this one. Don't come to church to get, 
Come to serve. And this is also true. We should not always come here expecting to receive things and take things and ask for things and want things. We should come with the expectation to serve and to give and to be sacrificial ourselves. But is that all there is to expect? See, I contend that, you know, if we're just coming to serve, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of groups out there that serve that give, that you come, you know, kind of with your gloves and your, your boots and, and you come with your hard hand, you come ready to work, you come, there, there's lots of volunteer organizations out there. But how does that affect your faith? Are you doing that in faith? You know, is there, I mean, the Rotary Club, I, I'm familiar with them, They're, it's a very good organization, but is that an organization that's built on faith? If we're not doing things in faith, how are we any different than some other organization out there? If we didn't come to expect something that was beyond what we see in nature and what happens in our everyday lives, then what is our gathering worth? I like this one. I don't want to be entertained when I go to church. I want an encounter with God. And some might even, you know, put up the counter argument, well, but I can encounter God anywhere. This is true also. But the larger question, what we're going to focus on today is, do we actually even expect to encounter God? When we come here, when we listen to the word, when we sing to God, when we pray, when we open up our heart, when we take time to talk to God. Do we expect, what do we expect from that encounter with God? What we're going to be doing as we're talking about having deeper faith is really, this is going to be challenging for a lot of us. I know it's challenging for me to really think, what have I come to expect from our relationship with God? Very often we will look at our society and the world we live in today. We've come into a new year in 2020 and we will look and we will think to ourselves, man, you know what? It's a shame that more people who clearly need to know who God is, they need a relationship with God, they need to be healed, they need Christ. And we'll think, well, it's a shame that more of them aren't here on Sunday morning, that, that more of them aren't here to worship with us, that more of them aren't studying their Bible and seeking out the understanding of who God is, and yet the question would be, and you know, I talked about the cruise, right? Wouldn't it be kind of a dud if you got if we got on that boat and we went on that cruise and there was no water? <laughs> Wouldn't it be kind of disappointing? I remember one year, this is a, a few years ago, um, we went on a cruise and we it was the Bahamas and we got to one of the islands and it was like colder here. I looked at it, it was colder on that island. It was rainy. It was colder than it was actually in Delaware. I thought, man, we could have stayed home for this, you know? <laughs> They literally had to cancel one of the ports we were going to stop it because the idea of going on a cruise is you expect it to be warmer. You expect it to be sunny. You expect it to, you know, the sun to hit your skin. You don't expect it to be cloudy and dreary and cold, colder than it is up north. And we get disappointed and we're frustrated and sometimes we don't understand why is it that more people are seeking God, but the Truth of the matter is, there are plenty of people who are seeking God. The question is, can he be found here? Will there be an encounter here? Because when we think of church and church culture and how we make up things here in our congregation, the question is, are we more interested in making sure that the chairs are in order and everything is clean and everything gets done on time? Are we interested in making sure that the experience is that somebody's faith has grown because they have had an encounter with God? And I'll even take it a step further. Do you even believe, when we talk about the Spirit being among us, do you even believe that the Spirit is among us here? Do you believe that there's an encounter to even be had when we show up here at 11 o'clock and so many of us clock in? When we show up, 
Is there an experience to be had? I want to look at some of these faith encounters as we go through the next handful of weeks here. I want to start by looking at 2 Kings, and we're going to spend a couple weeks in 2 Kings because there's a lot to take out of these chapters that we're going to be looking at. We're going to start in 2 Kings chapter 4. In verse 1 it says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slave. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, he said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your son. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her son. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped pouring. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. We see here, and just to recap this, we, we see an example here where this lady has a real world problem. She has a real world circumstance. She's got some real problems, and when it talks about her son's being taken away from her. Understand what was happening here was this. She has some debt. And this wasn't like she can go out and get a loan or, you know, anything like that. Basically, the law stated that since she has these sons, she couldn't pay off this debt. And now her husband is gone. So the resources financially were dried up. The idea was you now can send your sons off into indentured servitude. You send them out there and they can go work for your creditor, the person that you owe the money, until your debt is paid off. And that would be a finite amount of time. But she's troubled by this. She doesn't want to send her sons off for, you know, obvious reasons. And she approaches the man of God and says, you know that my husband, he was a man of faith and, and he was devout, he's all these things. But we have a real world problem. And so in essence, what she's saying is, I've got this situation. How is his faith and his reverence and his devotion to God, how is that going to fix it? Not very dissimilar to anything that we encounter on an everyday basis. Where we have issues and we have problems, we have things we encounter, and it's like, well, it's great that I have this faith in God. It's great that I believe in who this God is, this God who created the entire universe. But how is that going to fix my car problem? How is that going to fix this problem with gout that I'm having flaring up? How is this going to fix my, you know, issues with my coworker? How is how can God fix this thing? And we look at this, and it's very profound even though it's very simple, what Elisha tells her to do. But it starts with he told her to do something. He actually told her to go and do this thing. He said, go around, collect all these jars from your neighbors. Co collect all your neighbors, collect jars, right? Now you think about that, you think, well, what is a bunch of jars going to do? And, you know, I, I remember, you know, Flashback. I remember I had this sales job one time, and it was miserable. It was literally person to person, door to door sales. I only lasted a few days. Now I was a good salesman. I had other sales jobs, but this one was particularly tough. And a lot of it was because it was uncomfortable. It was just uncomfortable and very unorthodox, and it's frankly very unnatural 
to just show up and just walk up to a complete stranger and just start a conversation. Especially when they see you walking with a bag on your shoulder and it's like, oh, he's selling something. What does he got in there? Perfume or cologne or watch? You know, what is he selling, right? We, we see him. Don't, don't lie. You've seen him. You've been in the parking lot. You see him walking your way. You're like, hurry up. Hurry. Unlock the door. Like, hurry up. Get in, right? That's how uncomfortable this is, right? And yet he's telling her, go do something very unorthodox. Very uncomfortable. But it wasn't just go and do this thing. Do it in faith that God is going to reveal himself and he's going to fix your situation. And then what does he do? The little bit of oil she had, she would keep pouring it. And then they'd bring her another jar. And then that oil would refill. And she would pour. Now here's the thing. The ability for God to show that he's going to constantly refill that oil, that is a supernatural thing. That is not something we can explain through nature, through science. That is something that can only be explained by God, but it required that she do something first. She had to go collect those jars first for that supernatural thing to actually show up and be revealed. It required her faith to be followed up with action and that action to be demonstrated through that obedience. And then the supernatural work of God showed up. We see here the widow was required to do something. And it wasn't something that made sense. You know, I'm sure people were probably standing around thinking, what she want? I mean, okay, you can have a couple jars. I mean, go for it. I was thinking if a neighbor comes by and stops at the house and says, hey, can I get a couple of, you know, coffee mugs? I'm like, sure. Like, I've got tons of coffee mugs if you know what you need. And I'm sure my wife would love to get rid of some of these that we've collected over the years. Frankly, it would probably be less about coffee mugs. If they came to my house, they'd probably say, hey, can I get some T-shirts? <laughs> my wife would be like, oh, thank God you are here. Let me walk back here. And because I've got, like, Far too many to count. But the thing is, something that meant probably very little, if anything, I just thought it was a strange request to all these neighbors and people around her. They give her all these things, and, and they're thinking, what is this crazy lady hoarding all of these jars and all of these containers for? But it was so that God can demonstrate his power, something that was completely supernatural. But that was her faith. Do we have faith that expects those types of outcomes and those types of results? Do we relegate this to something on what that just happened in the Old Testament? Well, that's just something that happened back then. I, you know, I'm not about to go out here and collect a bunch of jars. Well, the question is, what does God want you to do that seems unorthodox? It seems like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But he's been asking you to do it, and you're not willing you want to go to the man of God. You want to go and you want to ask them for help. But the part that God is asking you to do for yourself, you are not willing to do. You know, I was thinking, getting back to the whole supernatural thing. Uh, I like this picture. The apple. Gravity is a lie. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like if I jump, I'm going to come back down. If I throw something in the air, it's going to land. You know, there are things that can be explained in nature, and we've studied it enough, and we understand it, but the fact is there are certain things that we cannot explain. They are, in fact, supernatural. They are things that don't make sense based on the laws of this world. Those are things that very often people, they want to write them off as some kind of anomaly or some, you know, freak accident or something. Faith is giving credit to God where it is due. Understanding that even if I can't make sense of it, I know it was God. Because it is your faith that makes a difference. God could do something supernatural like he did with that woman where it produced oil and it kept on refilling and refilling and refilling. But are we first willing to give God the credit and obey by going and doing that thing? We see, you know, I'm looking at this little boy here. You know, now, obviously, 
I'm not willing to believe that this little kid is Superman and he's just picking up, you know, rusty cars. But we see stuff like this and it's comical and, you know, we, we kind of, you know, look at it and adjust. But the fact of the matter is that, while we know that this is clearly either doctored or there's something propping that car up on the other side, what about when, you know, we see these typhoons, these cyclones, these hurricanes, these volcanoes erupting. I actually got an alert this morning talking about there was this imminent volcano eruption that's going to happen in the Philippines. The Philippines are sending everybody away. Puerto Rico, once again, getting hit with earthquakes and then multiple aftershocks. You know, we see these natural occurrences happen and we think, how can we reconcile that with faith? You know, because the fact that these things are actually supposed to happen. This is what we expect. If you actually talk to scientists and those who study it, these are things that are supposed to happen. It doesn't take that much when you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it to understand why forest fires seem to always happen in the same place, right around the same time. They're always happening. We see these occurrences, and yet, do we just look at that and say, well, that's just nature doing what it does? Or do we understand those things to be God? Do they take away from our faith? Do they chip away at our faith? Or do they enhance and increase our faith? Our understanding that we need to rely on God for everything. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42, skip down some there. It says, a man came from Baal, Shalashah, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men? The servant asked. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. You know, according to the word of the Lord. See, it requires some trust and obedience on our part to do things according to the word of the Lord, even if it doesn't make sense. He said, how is this little bit of bread that you brought me going to feed a hundred men? Sounds like a couple other Miracles and strange phenomena that we would go on to see later on that Jesus would perform. It's kind of like a pickle, right? You know, like you get a little preview of what's to come. But we see that God's saying, I'm not limited in the ways that man is limited. I, I don't struggle to make it enough. I have the ability to make even just a little bit of bread enough for a hundred, or even in the case of Jesus, where you see thousands of men. What is the limitation that God has? And what is it that keeps us, when we come here on Sunday morning to worship, when we come here to praise God, what is it that limits us and our ability to grow in our faith? It's our willingness to be obedient and do things in faith. Our faith must be rooted in the belief that God presents in unnatural and unexplainable ways. This is actually one of the most difficult things for us to do, especially in today's times in our society, is to believe that there are some supernatural things that God does, things that are unexplainable, and that they are from Him. Because we want everything to be nice and neat. We want everything to have answers. We want to be able to Google everything. We want to be able to explain every single phenomenon, not just the great things happening you know, all across the world, but even in your own life. Whatever that thing is where you say, God, why is this thing happening to me? Why doesn't this thing happen to me? Why is it that this is going on? Or why is it that this doesn't seem to ever change. Do we actually go to God, but do we actually go to God in faith? Asking the question, or one of us, some of us. 
But do we go to God in faith and do we think to ourselves, God, I am going to go to you. I'm going to get the answer. I'm going to expect the answer. I'm going to expect this answer. And I'm not necessarily going to expect it to always make sense. I'm not going to always expect to know why immediately, but I'm still going to have faith in you. Very often, we want the answers. We want all of the solutions. We want to know the outcome of our steps, the outcomes of our obedience before it happens. But that's not faith. Faith is not knowing what's at the end of the road. Faith is, I'm going to start down this road because this is what the Lord told me to do, and I know that he's going to be with me the whole way. Do we actually have that faith, and do we expect God to move in that way? Is this what we've come to expect from church? Because when we think about why it is it that churches are struggling to reach people, why is it that so many seats are empty? Why is it that churches all over the world, why, why is they're struggling? It's not the attacks of Satan and all the you know, ways in which people are facing persecution. Very often, it is our lack of faith that God can do the impossible. We read about stories, we pick up magazines, or we get online, we read Articles, we hear news stories about amazing things that are happening and different things that happen in people's lives. But do we even believe that that can happen to us? Not only do we believe that God can work in amazing ways in our own life, do we believe that God has chosen us to be his vessel so that we can go out and do the amazing? To be a part of the experience that is amazing that we will be able to witness. Have we left that in the book that we read? Have we left that in the Old Testament? Have we left that in the Bible? Or do we understand that God's still in the business of doing the amazing? The unorthodox will be able to produce amazing acts of faith, but do we even believe that anymore? Because if we don't, we're asking people, you know, we're sharing our faith, we're talking to people. We want them to come to Jesus. We want them to come to a relationship with God. But we're inviting them to go on a cruise with no water. We're asking them to believe in something, but don't expect any power to come from it. Don't expect it to change your life in any dramatic way. Don't expect anything to happen. Don't expect any hearts to move. Don't expect God to do anything amazing. There is nothing like seeing people who've been Christians. And we've all witnessed them. Maybe we've even been in this place at different times where we've seen Christians who've been Christians for a long time. They've been following Jesus for a long time. They can tell you every line and every verse in the Bible, but they have nothing to show for their life but the same old day-to-day -day monotony. God's not doing anything amazing, or at the very least, they can't witness it. They're not seeing it. They don't recognize it. And it's all because they don't have enough faith. Do we have enough faith to believe that God is going to do something amazing here? Just in Dover, just in your own life, do you have enough faith to believe that God's going to do something amazing, something impossible, something that nobody would ever be able to explain? Do we have faith that God is going to do it? If not, then why did we come here? Why are we here if we don't believe in that faith? Two questions I want to end with. I want to challenge us. Do I respond to moments of testing and crisis with faith in a God with limits or one that is over all things? We understand intellectually as best we can, we try to make sense of the fact that this God who's created the entire universe, he's over all things. Do we limit him when we go through times of testing? When we go through those moments of crisis? Do we understand that those challenges, those things that we see as obstacles, 
Do we see them from the vantage point in the view of faith? Or do we just look at them as a moment? When we don't view them from the standpoint, the lens of faith, we are limiting God. We're ignoring God. It's like, you know what? It's like that pastor who says, you know, I have a form of godliness, but I deny its power. Because God is all-seeing and all-knowing and all-powerful, and he's created all these things. And he cared enough to create me and put me in this place in this particular time. But even though he's right here with me, and I woke up this morning, I prayed, God be with me and order my steps and all these things. Even though he's right here with me, I'm not going to use him. I'm just going to keep on doing it the way I've been doing it and not looking at it from the standpoint of faith. Do my actions of obedience reflect faith in an outcome that is in God's hands or a person with nothing to lose? You know, I make those, I make that contrast there because very often we say, well, yeah, I prayed about it. And, and yeah, I, I took it to God. And you know what? I'm just waiting on him. But in reality, when we say I'm waiting on him, it's kind of like, well, I got nothing else to do. I don't have any other solutions. I don't have any other answers. I got no better alternative, so I guess I'll just get on my knees and pray. Not understanding that that's not faith. You know what I mean? This, this widow, if she goes out and she collects all these pots, I'm going to do it because, hey, you know, they're coming to get my boys tomorrow anyway, so I guess I got to do something, right? May as well kill some time. Go out and collect all these vessels and these pots, but she doesn't pour the oil. Because the faith was in, I don't know how this oil is going to keep regenerating. Guess what? When all of those vessels were full of oil, she goes out and sells them, and she satisfies her debt, and she still has some left over. Guess who cared the least about how it happened? Her. When you're in that trouble spot, when you're in that place, and God delivers you know what you're less concerned about? How it happened. You ever had that person say, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how I got through this. But God made it possible. I don't know how I made it. You know, I don't know how we survived. I heard a story, I remember, you know, but people telling me, you know, that they grew up poor. And it's like, I don't know how we had enough food. But God made it possible. What God really wants in that is for you to acknowledge and tell people that God made it possible. You may die, go to your grave, and never understand how it is that you all were never hungry. How it is that you made it through this troubled spot that you're in. But the question is just our act of obedience, is our getting on our knees and praying. When we go to God, are we doing it because we got nothing better to do? I got nothing to lose. Or are we doing it because we truly have faith? Not because someone told us, but because we genuinely have faith. Would the church look different if the members had faith in the supernatural? Can I move others towards a deeper faith if I would first be willing to take steps without knowing the entire plan? I mentioned this a few minutes ago. Very often, we want to know exactly how this is going to work out. We want to know exactly what, what this is going to lead us to. Even though we all know, we don't know the future. We make plans and we schedule things and we project things out. We have no idea what's going to happen in the next five minutes, much less what's going to happen in the next five years. We're just taking breath in and out right now. Heart's still pumping and beating. We're just going on. We're just assuming that we're going to get, you know, George is assuming he's going to watch the Seahawks beat the Packers. I don't know how that's going to work out. But he's assuming he's going to make it there. Here's the thing. We're all assuming we're going to get to this afternoon. We're assuming we're going to get to the evening. We're going to assume, you know what, hey, you know, my wife made lunch, and we're going to get home. We're going to eat. We make these assumptions, and we forget that all of that has to be done in faith. We get behind, I, you know, I often think about this. We get in these cars, and I drove from Tampa to get back here. Um, drove it all one fell swoop. It was 16 hours, 16 and a half hours. 
Go from Tampa to Dover. Somebody said, oh, exactly. I said last year I wasn't going to do it. And I did it again. But drove all the way from Tampa to here. And here's the thing. The only thing that kept me on many of those roads from hitting another car head on was two little strips of paint right down the middle of the road. Or a, a metal guardrail. There was a couple of times where the kids and my wife, they were asleep in the car. Truck. Swerve right in front of me. These things happen and we just get in our cars and we just walk into buildings. We don't know if they're up the code. We don't know if they've been compromised in any way. We don't know what's happening. But do we walk away from this building today in faith? Do we trust that God is the reason that we're still here, that we are still surviving, that we still have time, that we still have our mind, that we have the ability to go out and do? Or do we just say, well, you know, the human heart has so many beats in it, and, and, and the body is designed to live so long. Do we minimize what God is doing because we have no faith to be able to see what he's doing for us? How different would the church look if we expected to come back here on Wednesday or come back here on whatever time we come back <coughs> next Sunday, whatever it is. How different would this church look if it was a group of people who expected God to act and work and do things in faith? There's plenty of churches out there. There's plenty of groups that come together and sing songs and they may even sound a little better than us. I don't know. But there's plenty of these groups. There's plenty of these church buildings out here all up and down Delaware. You know what people are looking for? You know what young people are looking for? You know what the people who are the unchurched, who aren't particularly spiritual in our lives, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for an encounter with God. They're looking for a relationship with God. They're not just looking to, you know, hang out and meet new people all the time. Although, you know, there's some nice people here, I'd like to think. But that's not what the church, that's not what we come together and gather for. We come to praise and worship Him. We come to be uplifted. We come so that our faith can be increased. Is that what we expect when we show up here? When we show up here next Sunday, I imagine I'm going to see most, if not all, the same faces. Are we going to show up with an expectation that our faith is going to be increased, that we're going, our hearts are going to be moved, and that God is going to be here with us with His Spirit present, and that we are going to grow from it? Do we have that expectation? And how different would it look? How many more of these seats would be filled with our families, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers? If people knew that they could experience what it means to be in a relationship with God. And finally, very simply put, do I even believe in the supernatural? Have I just, resi just resigned that the idea of something that's supernatural that's beyond what we know about the principles of how the earth works and how human behavior is. Have I just resigned the supernatural to be something that those other people over there do? Have I just resigned that to be something that, well, you know, we're not holiness, we're not Pentecostal, you know, we don't do those things here. So does that mean that God does not work in those ways? Does that mean that God does not still work in unexplainable, unorthodox, and supernatural ways. As Christians, we cannot lower our expectations to just say, well, Christianity is just, we're going to follow a bunch of rules. That's exactly what the Jews were doing. That's exactly what the Pharisees were teaching them to obey. All of these rules were weighing them down. <laughs> what made Jesus so different what made what he taught different, what made his life different was that he wasn't just telling them rules and do's and don'ts. But there was power in what he was doing. When the disciples said, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples how to pray, they recognized that there was something different in the way that he was praying. He's praying in faith. He's praying with an expectation that his God will hear him and that he will move. Do we 
we have an expectation that God is going to do something? Where is your faith today? If you're someone who is struggling in your faith and you would like the prayers of the church, as we finish up here, I ask you to come forward when we stand singing here in just a moment. Allow the church, allow us to all come together and pray for you, help you with that. If you're someone who you maybe, you've never actually taken on having a relationship with God. Maybe you don't know what that means. Maybe no one's ever sat down and showed you through the scriptures what it means to follow in the example of Christ. What it means to have your sins forgiven. What it means to be baptized. What it means to make the commitment that I'm going to be a disciple of Christ and I'm going to follow him. And as a result, my faith will increase. I will experience what it is to have a relationship with God. If you've never done that, Please come forward. Don't walk away in doubt. Don't walk away uncertain. Don't take those jars of clay and say, you know what? It doesn't make sense to me. How is it that getting baptized in some water is going to change anything? It's just water. How is it that me deciding to give my life to God and to be different? How is that going to be, how is that going to be any different than how it was yesterday? <coughs> If you want to have faith in God as a church, allow us to help you. Allow us to help you get to that place so that you can know for yourself, not because of what your mama said or what somebody else said, but that your faith can be increased. This woman, these, these men and the bread that they brought, their faith was increased when they saw God work. Do you want to see God work? If you do, if you need the prayers of the church, if you, are, if you need help in understanding how it is that you can grow in your faith, please come forward as we stand and sing our song. Restore me, Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore my heart.